In our first perception of time, the world is incomplete. It is dull and gray, blanketed in an unending fog. Large arch trees barred their roots into the unformed earth, avoiding the crags that dominate the land. This is where the everlasting dragons call home. But one day in this dreary world, fire appeared and brought with it disparity. Heat and cold, light and dark, and of course, life and death. From this dark, the humanoids came, and within this flame they found the souls of lords. Three powerful souls were claimed by the Witch of Isolith, Nido, the first of the dead, and Lord Gwyn. A fourth unique soul, the Dark Soul, was found by the progenitor of mankind, the furtive pygmy, so easily forgotten. Through the strength bestowed by these Lord Souls, Lord Gwyn and the others challenged the ancient dragons. Though their power was substantial, the ancient dragons were a resilient foe, so Gwyn petitioned the pygmies to help in their war. Through the power of their Dark Soul, the pygmies' weapons and armor were forged in darkness, in the abyss, where humanity and or the Dark Soul draws its strength. In seeing this, fearing the seemingly endless strength, Lord Gwyn cast the seal of fire upon their weapons and armor to contain it. The pygmies would be mostly used for cannon fodder in this war and would receive no recognition for their deeds. Another way for Gwyn to deflect his fear of the dark and so begins Lord Gwyn's manipulation of humanity. The war being waged was fought fiercely by both sides but the fighting would prove more and more difficult for Lord Gwyn and his armies with each passing battle. For every dragon slain, they lost three score of their own. Gwyn's luck, however, would soon turn when Seath the Pale Drake turned on his own kind and revealed to Gwyn the secret of ancient dragon's immortality, their stone scales, and that their weakness to lightning would peel apart these scales. So Lord Gwyn took on the mantle of the Lord of Sunlight, and he and his knights conjured mighty bolts of lightning to hurl at the dragons. It wouldn't be long until the gods had become victorious, and the ancient dragons were no more. This is the start of the Age of Fire, a golden age created by Gwyn upon the dragon's defeat. In this age, most life would begin to flourish. The gods were thriving, they erected grand civilizations, Gwyn created the beautiful Anor Londo, the city of the gods, and things were relatively good. Gwyn granted Seath the Scaleless a piece of his own lord soul, bestowed a dukedom upon him, and constructed the grand archives in which Seath would retire and begin his research into immortality. But as we know, all good things must come to an end, and fire cannot burn forever. And soon the flame that illuminated Gwyn's Age of Fire began to fade and the world teetered on the precipice of an age of darkness. Gwyn feared this dark, now more than ever, and recognized it for what it was. In this age, humanity would flourish, and the pygmies would reign as gods over them, for their soul is made of that very dark. In fear of this impending dark, the gods were desperate for a means to stave it off. The first solution came from the Witch of Isolith and her Daughters of Chaos. Using a soul, they attempted to recreate the first flame. Somewhere along the line of playing creator, or perhaps just not being powerful enough, something went wrong, and they instead created an unwieldy fire, the flame of chaos. For all their worth, the witch and her daughters worked hard to keep the flame under control. During this, one of the witch's daughters, Quilana, fled from her duties and from her family. She would return in the far future to feign ablution and pretend to seek answers, but to what end, we do not know. It's hard to determine exactly how long the witch and her daughters were able to contain this flame, but chaos, however, is true to its nature and could not be held at bay forever. Eventually, the would-be restorers of fire were engulfed by their flame of chaos, and with that, all of Isolith. Some of the witch's daughters and followers were disfigured into beasts and demons, some were seemingly unscathed, and some were and are missing, but there are certainly rumours as to their whereabouts. As for the witch herself, it's hard to say. Some believe that she herself became the bed of chaos, the only thing left behind in the wake of the cataclysm, and from it demons were birthed. Some believe that the witch was completely consumed by the flame, and that her powerful soul was only the catalyst responsible for creating the bed of chaos, and some believe she simply disappeared. The truth of the matter, though, 
is that we'll never know. But the dark was still looming over Gwyn and the gods, and their options were dwindling. More concerned about himself and his own kind, Lord Gwyn conceived a plan to manipulate the pygmies further. To the pygmy lords he granted great crowns, and bestowed to them a grand city at the world's end, the Ringed City. In return for the human lords to sit within those walls and keep the Dark Soul there, as at this point Gwyn had convinced the masses that the Dark Soul spelled trouble. Gwyn also relinquished his youngest daughter to the Dark, though he promised to return for her when the time was right. The Ringed City was used as a containment of sorts, to banish the Dark Soul to the end of the world and keep it cut off. Perhaps Gwyn thought this would be enough to save them, and in some way, I suppose it did. The way of the white was a church or a cult, perspectives important, dedicated to Gwyn's age of fire, and preserving it in any way necessary, became the most widely known and most commonly practiced religion in the world, humanity included. So in Gwyn's deception, even humanity fell in line with Gwyn's lies. Perhaps it was that they never sought their own power, or perhaps they didn't know. As we'll learn in time, however, some of humanity certainly knew of their obtainable power and warred for it. But the pygmy lords sat at the world's end, inside of their walls, content to keep the Dark Soul in check on Gwyn's behest. The Dark Soul, though, resides in all humanity, whether it was spread to them by the furtive pygmy upon finding this soul, or that it's the true nature of mankind. Much like Chaos, the Dark Soul could surely not be contained forever. With Izalith in ruin and the demonic threat spreading, Gwyn stood on the precipice of yet another war. He took with him an army of his Silver Knights and descended into Izalith to snuff out the demon threat. We can't know for sure how long this war lasted, or how long the demons existed before Gwyn took the war to them, but there are traces of demonic civilizations and a hierarchy among them, as they had a king and a prince. One way or another, Gwyn was also no match for Chaos. His band of Silver Knights were charred to black, and failing to defeat the demons he retreated. Gwyn was out of time. The Age of Dark had dawned and his fire had burned out. Gwyn knew now the drastic lengths he would have to go to, but he first had the foresight to split pieces of his powerful soul among those he trusted, as well as a piece of it went to the Four Kings of New Londo, but we'll come back to that later. Gwyn commanded his people to shepherd humanity and with no other choice, he took off with his remaining knights to the Kiln of the First Flame. It was here that Gwyn sacrificed himself to preserve his Age of Fire. Using his body as the kindling, he ignited himself to reignite the First Flame and to bring back the Age of Fire. In doing so, he placed the same seal of fire he had previously placed upon the abyss-forged weapons and armor of humanity upon the Dark Soul itself, afflicting the undead curse upon humanity. Humans were branded with the dark sign, and a cursed symbol that marked them as undead. Cursed to never die, reborn after death time and time again. With each death they lost more and more of their humanity until none remained and they would go hollow. Losing their minds, losing themselves, losing every bit of humanity except for life itself. The Age of Fire is restored, but Gwyn, having become the first Lord of Cinder, is nothing but a hollowed husk of the powerful god that he once was. He stays at the kiln, sitting in defense of the first flame as his eternal duty. The Way of White recognizes the threat that the undead pose, and upon Gwyn's command to shepherd humanity, they lead great undead hunts, corralling those hollowing into asylums. There, the undying men and women would await the end of the world. Of course, not all undead would share this fate. Here, we turn our eyes towards two primordial serpents, starting with the one called Kaf. Not much is known about these toothy serpents, but as their name suggests, they've been around for quite a while. Soon, we'll learn we have to take everything they say with a grain of salt. Kath makes his way to the city of Ulasil, known for its ancient and golden sorceries. Far beneath the city was the tomb of the primeval man, Manus. Kath was the serpent advocate for the dark. He didn't believe in Gwyn's Age of Fire and was in search of the one chosen to be the Dark Lord, the one who will usher in the true Age of Dark. Kath convinced the people of Ulasil to awaken the primeval man, but in doing so they drove Manus to madness. His humanity snapped, and he went wild as he endlessly sought his precious pendant, likely the last tie to who he truly was, or whom he loved. As for what the pendant contained, we may never know, but it is said of humanity that the will feels envy, or perhaps love, 
and despite the inevitably trite and tragic ending, the will sees no alternative and is driven madly towards its target. And so, Manus became the beastly father of the Abyss. The Abyss began spawning off of Manus himself, and quickly threatened to swallow all of Ulysseel, and eventually the world. As the fall of Ulysseel begins, and its citizens are tainted by the Abyss into disfigured creatures, Manus kidnaps Dusk, the princess of Ulysseel, and drags her into the Abyss. Koth then makes his way to New Londo, where the four kings who were granted a piece of Gwyn's powerful soul ruled. Koth played a role in their fall to Dark when he dangled the power of Life Drain before them. He incited the Covenant known as the Dark Wraiths, which consisted of the Knights of the Four Kings. He granted these Knights the Art of Life Drain, which allowed them to sap the humanity from other humans in order to preserve their own. The Four Kings and their Dark Wraiths were intended to play a role in following the Dark Lord and ushering in the Age of Dark, an Age of Man. The Dark Wraiths could invade the worlds of other humans to pillage their humanity, and because of this were often referred to as the enemy of man, although, as with most things in Dark Souls, that notion is completely subjective. And so, we see the Abyss spring up in New Londo as well, as its kings and their people willingly embrace the Dark. It is what it is. This is where we meet Knight Artorius, one of the four Knights of Gwyn. Knight Artorius made it his mission to battle back against the Abyss at every turn, and was known for annihilating Dark Race throughout his quest. However, the Abyss in New Londo was different than in Ulysseel. While the Abyss itself was the same, in Ulysseel it was spawning from Manus, but in New Londo it was simply just there. There wasn't any conventional way to prevent the Abyss in New Londo from tainting its way to the rest of the world. So, three sealers sealed the city and flooded it with water. This was their only perceived way to contain the Abyss here, though it was an agonizing decision. Countless lives were lost, the robust culture of a city erased. The victims of this flood would go on to roam the city's ruins as ghosts. Knight Artorius then set off to Ulysseel with his wolf companion, Sif. Artorius, having made a covenant with the beasts of the abyss, wore a ring that symbolized this, and allowed Artorius to freely traverse the endless dark. So. He and Sif descended into the abyss to slay Manus and halt the spread of it. But a hero such as Artorius has nary a murmur of dark, and would thus become corrupted by it. Before losing his mind to the abyss, he used his great shield to place an aura around his companion Sif to keep the wolf safe. Thus, the hero Artorius falls to dark and is nothing more than the creatures he hunted. But Time is indeed a convoluted and confusing thing in Dark Souls, and things get a little interesting here. In the future, the world sings the songs of praise for Artorius the Abyss Walker, the hero who defeated Manus, and put an end to the Abyss's threat. Only, that isn't what happened at all. But we'll have to circle back to this at a later point. Back at An Orlando, the great city of the gods, Guinevere, the eldest daughter of Gwyn, and the other gods flee from the city. Lord Gwyn is gone, and the abyss is sprouting up all over Lordran, and eventually the flame will fade again. So they fled. To where? We can't be sure, but one god did stay behind, Gwendolyn, Gwyn's youngest son and the god of the Darkmoon. Gwendolyn was a master of illusions, and though the sun had set on An Orlando and it was in a bleak and depressing state, he used his illusions to restore the once great city. He brought back the shining sun, the sentinels to guard, and even placed an illusion of his sister Guinevere within the city. All seemed well in An Orlando again, and so the Age of Fire continued. For how long this time, we still can't be sure. We fast forward to the flame fading once again, as we knew it would, and the world back on that same precipice facing an Age of Dark. The story leads us to the Northern Undead Asylum. Here, locked within a cell, we find a lonely and all but hollowed human marked with the dark sign, the Chosen Undead. Through a hole in the roof, an unnamed knight of Astora drops the Chosen Undead the key to their cell. Escaping this dreary cell, they wander through the asylum in search of escape, until they run into the same knight that dropped the key, sitting amidst the pile of rubble. This knight of Astora reveals the ancient legend of the chosen undead. Thou who art undead art chosen, and that one day an undead will be chosen to make pilgrimage to the land of the Lord's Lordran. 
and when thou ringeth the bell of awakening, the fate of the undead thou shalt know. Luckily, this gravely wounded knight of Astora freed from their cell the very undead that this prophecy speaks of. The chosen undead continues to search for an exit, only to find it guarded by the asylum demon. After defeating this demon, they receive a key to the large door leading out of the asylum, only to find there isn't anywhere to go, as the asylum is isolated in the middle of nowhere. Before being able to scan their surroundings, a giant crow swoops in and ushers the chosen undead to Firelink Shrine, a focal point in their journey. It is at Firelink Shrine that the chosen undead meets a firekeeper, a woman slated with the duty of tending to bonfires across Lordran. Each firekeeper is a corporeal manifestation of her bonfire, and is a draw for the humanity offered to her, and thus her soul is gnawed at by infinite humanity. The bonfire offers an undead a place of repose, there they can burn pieces of humanity to regain their own. In simpler terms, think of the bonfire as an airplane, and the undead as first-class passengers, and the firekeepers as the ultimate stewardesses. In Firelink Shrine, the chosen undead also meets a rather crestfallen warrior, who tells them that there are actually two bells of awakening. One above Firelink in an abandoned cathedral, and another deep down below in the ruins of Blighttown. The Chosen Undead sets out to ring these bells of awakening, one guarded by the Cathedral Gargoyles, and the other guarded by Quelog, one of the Witch of Isola's demon-deformed daughters. Upon ringing the second bell, the gates of Sen's Fortress, the perilous house of traps and puzzles, the only way through the city of Inorlando opens. Before traversing Sen's Fortress, the Chosen Undead returns to the Firelink Shrine where he meets a primordial serpent by the name of Framped. This serpent, unlike his counterpart, Koth, sides with Lord Gwyn in his Age of Fire, and wishes to see it extended. Framp tells the Chosen Undead that he was the close friend of Lord Gwyn, and that it is their fate to succeed Lord Gwyn, to link the flame, cast away the dark, and undo the curse of the undead. He says that the Chosen Undead must go first to Anorlando to retrieve the Lord Vessel. The Chosen Undead heads to the direction of Anorlando by first traversing through the House of Traps, Sense Fortress. In this fortress, they find an imprisoned scholar by the name of Big Hat Logan. The Chosen Undead helps to free Logan before continuing on. Atop Sen's fortress, we see that the way to Anorlando has been caved by a rock and debris, and being guarded by a giant iron golem. But after defeating this golem, the Chosen Undead is ushered over the walls into Anorlando by batwing demons. How or why these demons are in the service of the gods, we may never know. Here in the City of the Gods, the Chosen Undead finds their search for the Lord Vessel barred by two knights, Ornstein, one of the four knights of Gwyn, and Smo. But because the Chosen Undead is the fork in cat's pajamas, they defeat their adversaries and press onward. Within the next room, the Chosen Undead comes face to face with Gwyn's eldest daughter, Guinevere, though they know not that she is just an illusion crafted by Gwendolyn, Gwyn's youngest son and god of the Dark Moon who stayed behind in the abandoned city of the gods, casting his illusions to set the Chosen Undead upon their path. The illusion of Guinevere gives the Chosen Undead a speech not unlike Framps, succeed my father and link the flame. She then bestows the Lord Vessel upon them, which the Chosen Undead returns to Frampt. Frampt transports the Chosen Undead to the Firelink Altar and tells them to place the Lord Vessel upon it. The altar is placed before a large door, one that leads to the kiln of the first flame and to the Lord of Cinder, Gwyn himself. In order to open this door, the Chosen Undead will need to satiate the Lord Vessel with powerful souls. Frampt tells them to retrieve the Lord Soul of both the Witch of Isolith and of Grave Lord Nito. He also says to retrieve the bequeathed shards of Lord Gwyn's soul from Seath the Scaleless and the Four Kings of Nulondo. On the way to the Duke's archives in Anorlando to retrieve the Shard of Gwyn's soul from Seath, the Chosen Undead makes their way through Darkroot Garden. It is here that the timeline may take a weird turn. In the garden, the Chosen Undead frees a woman who found herself trapped within a crystalline golem. She tells them that she is Princess Dusk of Ulaseel, and not of this land or of this time, but thanks them for helping her. When the Chosen Undead arrives in the Duke's archives, they see the same crystalline golems, and from one falls half of a broken pendant attached to a vine that appears to originate from Ulaseel. So the Chosen Undead returns to the garden to see what Princess Dusk makes of this. However, instead of Dusk, 
they find what appears to be a fractured tear through time, as a large hand emerges from within the tear and drags the chosen undead in. They find themselves in Ulusil, though not of the current time, likely from when and where Dusk was claiming she was from before. Here the chosen undead meets a talking mushroom named Elizabeth, who tells them that Dusk has been dragged into the abyss that is currently swallowing Ulysil by Manus. These being the events we talked about earlier, weird timelines are a staple in Dark Souls lore. Either way, the chosen undead agrees to help Dusk, but they first come face to face with Knight Artorius. Though this is the Artorius that fell corrupted to the dark of the abyss and can't tell friend from foe as he attacks the Chosen Undead. The Chosen Undead puts Artorius out of his misery and presses on towards the abyss. Within the edge of the abyss, the Chosen Undead finds Artorius' wolf companion, Sif, still within the magical aura she was placed in by the Great Shield. The Chosen Undead eliminates the threats that had surrounded Sif, allowing the wolf to safely make their escape. Further in the Abyss, the Chosen Undead finally finds Manus, the primeval man. A fight erupts and the Chosen Undead finds a way to slay the Father of the Abyss, which halts it from further spreading through Ulysseel and the world. So the Chosen Undead plays the role of Artorius from the Legends of the Abyss Walker. Only, it wasn't Artorius that defeated Manus and halted the spread of the Abyss, but the Chosen Undead will never receive that recognition. Either way, they rescue Dusk from the Abyss and return to their own time. Back in the Duke's archives, the Chosen Undead runs into Big Hat Logan again, who has been here studying Seath's crystal sorceries. He tells the Chosen Undead how to kill Seath, that his immortality is linked to the primordial crystal. During their showdown with Seath, the Chosen Undead first shatters his crystal before they can claim Seath's life as well as the shard of Gwen's soul. They then tread down into the ruins of Isolith to dismantle the Bed of Chaos and claim the remains of the Witch of Isolith's soul. After that, it's a trip into the Tomb of the Giants to defeat Grave Lord Nido and take his soul as well. Finally, all that remains is the last piece of Lord Gwen's soul held by the four kings of Nulondo. But in order to face them, the Chosen Undead will need to find a way to traverse the abyss. The solution is Artorius's ring, which is unfortunately guarded by a now fully grown giant gray wolf Sif who, although still remembers the Chosen Undead from saving them once upon a time, will perpetually guard her master's grave, even if she doesn't want to. Thus, the Chosen Undead puts a tragic end to the wolf, and receives the Covenant of Artorius. And just remember, when you get sad or angry thinking about this majestic puppers, this is all Gwyn's fault. With Artorius's ring, the Chosen Undead is able to enter the Abyss and claim the piece of Gwyn's soul from the Four Kings. They then return to the Firelink Altar to place the souls within the Lord Vessel and open the way to the Kiln. The Chosen Undead passes through the opened gates towards the First Flame, in belief that they are about to save the world. There at the kiln, Gwyn sits before the first flame, still but the hollowed husk of the lord he once was, but powerful nonetheless. Here the two do battle, for what Gwyn is fighting for he may not even remember, but the chosen undead fights to extend the fire and to lift the curse of their people. At the end of their bloody fight, the chosen undead stands alone at the kiln of the first flame, it stands where it all started and where it all could end. The first flame, such a fragile conundrum of peace and despair, the chosen undead extends themselves to the flame, lets it consume them, to use their body and soul as kindling to breathe life back into the flame and thus extending the age of fire yet again.
Many kingdoms rose and fell on this tract of earth. Mine was by no means the first. Anything that has a beginning also has an end. No flame, however brilliant, does not one day splutter and fade. This land is a land of cycles. Countless asshats have attempted to erect kingdoms in this region, only to fail miserably, proving, without a doubt, that they are useless trash, just like your waifu. Now, listen carefully, skeleton. A while ago, a hairy lad known as Manus, Daddy of the Abyss, went and died in a 1v1 PvP duel. Upon this scrub's demise, the darkness within him fragmented and scattered. These fragments of the primordial papa would manifest into beings of manipulation, creatures of the dark. These children of menace would go on to shape the essence of the kingdoms they helped to create, as well as destroy. The bastard kids of menace attached themselves to lords, powerful men that would go on to conquer these lands. They formed great townships that would prosper for but a moment, before being swallowed by the cycle once again. Many monarchs have come and gone. One drowned in poison, another's tongue to flame. Still another slumbers in the realm of ice. Not one of them stood here. As you do now. Unfortunately, the kingdoms of these monarchs would always become corrupt and fall into ruin, much like my bowels on Taco Tuesday. Here are but a few examples of such a downfall. Chulva, the Sanctum City, home of the slumbering dragon, was invaded by the Drake Blood Knights. They disturbed the dragon and unleashed a big stink upon the kingdom. Broom Tower was abandoned by its father, the Iron King, when he went out for cigarettes and never returned. Falling into ruin, the tower came under the control of Nadalia, Bride of Ash. And Liam Lois, once a prosperous kingdom, was consumed by a terrible winter after the Ivory King failed to return from conquest into the basement. Alsana, the silent oracle, created the unyielding frost to safeguard against the churning chaos that had claimed the king. The deep chronology of these fallen kingdoms struggles to manifest in the history of this land. One figure, however, managed to rise above the obscurity of time, and through his accomplishments, cemented his reign in history, the Iron King. Once a troglodyte like yourself, the Iron King was visited by an elite otaku, only known as Sir Alon. With the assistance of this katana-wielding badass, the king led a conquest into the land of Ven, expending most of his wealth in the process. Triumphant yet drained, the king uncovered the Scorching Iron Scepter, an iron-producing miracle. The king proceeded to create a great metal fortress within the old region of Alcan. This keep, whose walls were clad with only the strongest iron, was appropriately deemed the Iron Keep. His tower now obsolete, the king abdicated the region in favor of his new home. Prosperity would not follow, as the undead degenerates would soon descend upon the land. The Iron King corralled the hoodlums in the huntsman's copes in an attempt to stave off the curse's influence, subjecting them to gruesome and inhumane conditions. With his realm on the decline, the Iron King turned to experimentation. He sought power and wanted to recreate the golems of legend. It was probably then that his longtime friend and advisor, Sir Weeaboo, abandoned the king, fearing he had gone too far. Unperturbed, the Iron King continued his research. With the assistance of some dude named Igil, the king created the Smelter Demon, an obscenely powerful automaton. The Smelter Demon overpowered its masters and began terrorizing the hall of the Iron Keep. Now in ruin, the heavy fortress slowly sinks into the earth. There's good iron in these parts. An old king even used it to build a castle. But the thing was too heavy. It slowly sank into the ground. Fire spouted from the earth, and, and the place turned into this. At least, that's what I'm told. A bad story, eh? The story of Drang Lake is very much the story of its monarch, as if the two were linked together by fate. Not much is known about where he came from, or what he found when he arrived in this land that had seen countless kingdoms rise and fall before him, but when Vendrick managed to obtain the strength of the old four ancient ones, he quickly rose to power. With his faithful knights, Velstad and Raimi, and his older brother Aldia, he became the undisputed ruler of Dranglake, and under the leadership of monarch and scholar, Dranglake finally flourished. As it was with the kingdoms before it, Dranglik was visited by a fragment of Manus named Nashandra. Just like her sisters, Nashandra managed to win the king's favor and ear. And with this new queen at court, things began to change. 
Claudia, who had been given lordship by his brother, became obsessed with his research and barely ever left his solitary keep. Meanwhile, the new queen urged Vendrick to travel across the ocean and lay waste to the giants inhabiting it. A misguided mistake that he would eventually commit. Vendrick brought war to the giants across the sea and returned with an unnamed prize. In his own words, I subdued the giants and claimed their strength so that I might step closer to fire. With the strength of the giants, golems were created and used to construct Drenglea Castle, where Vendrick and Nishandra resided. Their victory was short-lived, however, when the surviving giants mounted a counterattack on Drangleic. Motivated by revenge or to reclaim what Vendrick stole, they rampaged through the lands, leaving chaos and ruins in their wake. In a war that lasted for generations, the giants laid siege to Drangleic until an unnamed combatant killed the giant lord and the survivors were forced to retreat. Drangleic won the war against the giants but paid dearly for it. While Drangleic was still recovering, Vendrick and his now queen Nishandra heard reports of a curse of undeath spreading throughout the land. Vendrick tasked the Flexile Century to bring the afflicted to the Lost Bastille and hired assassins from the Order of Shadow Knights to slay Hollows while Aldia worked on a cure. Their efforts were in vain and the curse ran rampant through Drangleic. The brothers eventually grew apart in the fight against the curse and Aldia was banished to his mansion that would later become known as Aldia's Keep. The undead curse continued until even Vendrick was afflicted. Through his research and being afflicted by the curse himself, he saw the world more clearly and realized Nishandra's true nature. Taking his loyal knight Vilstat, Vendrick made his last preparations and left Drangleic Castle for the undead crypt where he eventually hollowed. Now the king withers underground and his kingdom with him. Much like the kingdoms before it, Drangleic fell victim to the things that lurk below the chaos, the darkness, and the great souls of old. Sometime after the war with the giants in Drang Lake, an undead from a faraway land south of the kingdom is suffering from the effects of the undead curse. We see them losing their memory, and in an attempt to halt the degradation, they find their way to the lodgings of an old woman, who we later find out is an old firekeeper. Upon seeing our fallen state, the old woman spins us a tale of a land far to the north, an old kingdom called Drangleic. The old firekeeper tells us that souls found in this land may be enough to mend our ailing mind. The undead then stumbles his way towards the fabled kingdom, near total hollowing as they find their way to the entrance of that storied kingdom. At first glance there appears to be nothing left but ruins, however in the centre of a ruined building is a tree covered in flame butterflies. The undead disturbs them and this swarm begins to cover the area, lighting all the torches and seemingly opening the way to this lost kingdom, for in the reflection of the water we now see the reflection of the kingdom that once was. In the cyclone in the water, a black hole tears itself and our protagonist throws themselves in. Upon awakening, they find themselves in a place called Things Betwixt, Things betwixt essentially meaning things between. We can only conclude that this is a place between the world of Drangleic and the place that we came from. This is in fact confirmed later by housekeeper Millibeth, who we meet in the house that we find in Things Betwixt. She tells us that This is a limbo. A link between Drangleic and the outer world. This is a limbo between Drangleic and where we came from. The denizens that we find in this house, kept by housekeeper Millibeth, are wearing the same clothes as the old deer that directed us here in the opening cinematic, and Millibeth speaks of these women. The old women were once firekeepers, but now the fire shows signs of fading, and she also confirms there were once a fourth, which is the old woman that directed us here. These firekeepers mock us and laugh at us for our hollowing state noting that we are close to completely fading away, for we cannot even remember our own name. Yet they help us restore our memory by passing us a human effigy. They claim this is an effigy of us, i.e. it is an object that is supposed to look or remind us of ourselves. Using the effigy, the bearer of the curse can remember their name and who they were before. With their memory temporarily restored, they finally leave things betwixt 
and end up in Majula, an undead refuge. Here we find the crestfallen Saldan, who tells us of Majula. This is Majula. It is a kind of settlement, a place where life is almost normal. And in Drang Lake these days, there are very few places like that. This is where the flotsam and jetsam of Drang Lake end up. The bearer of the curse will meet several characters here, all who are here for their own reasons and motivations. It is here that we first meet the Emerald Herald, who will act as our guide here, for she directs us to the way we can overcome the curse, and it is she who names us Bearer of the Curse, a moniker that describes our burden and will stay with us the entire journey. She says, Bearer of the Curse, you will never meet the king with a soul so frail and pallid. Seek those whose names are unutterable, the four endowed with immense souls. Their souls will serve as beacons. Once you have found them, return here to me, so that hope will not fade away. The Herald tells us that to overcome our curse, the curse of the undead, we must seek powerful souls and then meet the King of Drang Lake, Vendrick. Specifically, she tells us that we are to seek the four old beings with unutterable names and powerful souls. The Herald also directs us to that tiny thing inside the ruins, an ancient being that can impart wisdom. This being is the cat that we know to be Sweet Shalcor, whose true nature eludes us. However, she does impart wisdom on the four great beings who we are to track down and gain power from. She says, Are you going to see the old ones? Those four who have grown so incredibly ancient. During our search for these great ones, the bearer of the curse sees many things across the kingdom, including signs of Drang Lake's past war with the giants in the forest of the fallen giants. In the forest we find fallen giants, funnily enough, who have begun taking root and become trees, as well as the remains of a crumbling fortress manned by hollowing Drang Lake soldiers. The soldier key tells us the purpose of this construction, as it reads, A fort was erected in the forest to face the giants, but now the soldiers are lost and hollowed. They are enfeebled, but not without honour, and continue to steadfastly defend their country. So we know this was a battlement, specifically built on the coast to defend against the giants, who came from across the sea. Imprisoned in a chamber below the fortifications is the last giant, and when the bearer of the curse encounters this being, it becomes enraged upon seeing us, and flies into a rage and attacks. It is almost as if it recognises the bearer of the curse, a conundrum that will be answered later in their journey. Having walked through the shattered remains of the battlefield, the bearer of the curse explores the far corners of the land of Drang Lake in search of four great souls. In doing so, they will pass through the remains of other fallen kingdoms, like Hade, Harvest Valley, and the Kingdom of the Iron King. The hunt takes them to the Lost Bastille, the prison that was once used by Vendrick to imprison the hollowing undead that would be shipped there from Drang Lake via No Man's Wharf to handle the outbreak. In a special tower called Sinner's Rise, in the lowest dungeon, there is a being called the Lost Sinner. Her soul attempts to explain why she is called this. Soul of the Last Sinner Prisoner of Sinner's Rise, the Lost Sinner eternally punishes herself for the sins of her past. The Lost Sinner is one of the four great beings that the Emerald Herald told us of, and Shalquar gives us a further explanation as to who the Sinner could be. They created a towering Bastille to contain them, but in the end it did no good. The Lost Sinner lives deep within the Bastille, the Fool, trying to light the first flame. There is one being who we know tried to recreate the first flame, yet it doesn't explicitly mention anyone by name. However, on New Game Plus, the Lost Sinner also drops the Old Witch Soul, and she seems to be infected or controlled by a Chaos Bug. The implication being is that the being before us owns an ancient soul of a witch which has been recycled into a new being, an old witch who once tried to recreate the first flame. The search for the four great souls also takes the bearer of the curse 
into the very depths of the land. Through the well that's in the centre of Medulla lies the gutter, a place where a squalid settlement has taken place, a place that is described by the forgotten key item as all manner of terrible things have been cast into the gutter in Medulla, forming a settlement of filth and chaos. So we take the path of the discarded down into the depths of a shanty town for those forgotten by the world, and then beyond into the Black Gulch, where the bearer of the curse finds the rotten, another bearer of a mighty and ancient soul. The rotten has created a sanctuary for the lost things found in the Black Gulch and the gutter, for its soul reads, Soul of the rotten, who writhes deep within the gutter. The rotten embraces all in his sanctuary for all things unwanted or tossed away. His embrace may not be an embrace to be desired, given that his body is made up of those who have been lost and embraced by him. A writhing collection of the lost. If this being is destroyed in New Game Plus, it also drops an additional soul. A soul called Old Dead One Soul. This is again a reminder that this being holds a soul that is extremely ancient and has probably seen many cycles and reincarnations. There was once an ancient being who was considered first of the dead, but the connections are for the player to make, if any. The next ancient soul awaits in the fallen kingdom of the old Iron King, of which we have already discussed previously in this series. The bearer of the curse comes to the sunken Iron Fortress, and faces down the old Iron King himself, who has been transformed into a hideous demon-like being, formed of pure magma. His soul tells us that he fell and was possessed by the things that lurk below. Given this is a canon series, we cannot readily speculate as to what these things that come from below are, but we can assume that his being possessed is why he is so monstrously transformed. Once again in New Game Plus, it drops an ancient soul known as Old King Soul. The game does not definitively name who this Old King is, but this soul can be traded for the item Blinding Bolt, which reads as follows. Crafted in ancient times by the God of Sun, but later forbidden by that same deity, was it to protect the world from hatred or sorrow? We once knew a God of Sun who once wielded lightning bolts and this god was also a king. All we know for sure is that an ancient king's soul inhabits the same vessel as the old Iron King. The final of the four great souls required to meet the king is found in Brightstone Seldora, a mining community that was once run by Duke Seldora, as per the Brightstone Cove Key, which reads as follows. The eccentric Lord Seldora, known for his fascination with spiders, built a town and a personal fortune by mining Brightstone. One day the town was overrun by spiders, but Lord Seldora only stood by and watched, eerily contented. That is indeed the state we find the town in, covered in spiders and an army camp posted at the entrance to contain the fallen town. What is the cause of this outbreak? In the depths of the mine, hanging from the corpse of an everlasting dragon, is the being known as Duke's dear Freya, a monstrous two-headed spider who seems to be the broodmother for the rest of the spiders found here. Upon the defeat of this colossal beast, we don't get notice of a great soul being embraced, unlike the others, but instead we get it when we interact with a soul on the ground that is beneath the dragon's corpse. Clues as to what this could mean comes from Freya's soul, as the soul reads as follows. Soul of the Duke's dear Freya, the Writhing Ruin's Keeper. The Writhing Ruin is an ancient thing whose shadow remains cast over the land. It first took possession of a solitary insect but grew its power, feasting on the wealth of twisted souls found in the land. There are two separate entities talked about here, an insect, which is the Duke's dear Freya, and the Writhing Ruin. It seems that this writhing ruin was the one that took possession of a spider, the Duke's dear Freya, and grew it to the size it is now. But who is this writhing ruin that has been kept by this giant insect? Well, Sweet Shalcor can also give us a hint as to who this might be. Oh, it's like that awful traitor long ago. He coveted what he did not have, and it drove him mad. What a curious conundrum. The writhing ruin keeps searching as we speak, 
searching for its heart's desire. We once knew a writhing mess who wanted something they did not have. In addition, we get our hands on a special soul if we win this fight in New Game Plus. Old Paldrake Soul. And perhaps it is this separate being who we are interacting with on the ground when we embrace the great soul. Perhaps there is an old Paldrake that we know of who once sought what he did not have, who now finds himself underneath the corpse of an ancient dragon. Upon the defeat of this last old one, the bearer of the curse is confronted by a being of fire and roots, which emerges from the primordial fire. No one has come this far, not for a very long while. Young Harlow, do you wish to shed this curse? We will later come to learn that this is Aldia, brother of Vendrick and scholar of the first sin. He comments on the fact that no one has come this far in a very long time i.e. no one has come close to being this powerful for a very long time. He then states that there are only two paths, two paths before us. Inherit the order or destroy it. He then encourages us to follow Vendrick's path and bids us farewell. We will meet Aldia again. With all four old souls in hand, the Emerald Herald tells us to proceed to the castle. And now we are in possession of the powerful souls, the Shrine of Winter, which blocks passage to the castle, will open for us. In the castle we see evidence of golems that are powered by souls, including the two that open the door. We meet the ghost of Chancellor Welligar, who not only explains the presence of the golems, but gives a potted history of what happened here that was explained in the Rise of Fall of Dran Lake. The bearer of the curse then climbs the castle and meets Nishandra, who is wearing a beautiful queenly guise far from her true form that we will see later on. She tells the undead that the king has long since fled and implores them to follow the king. Why does she do this? Because she wants access to the throne of want, which Fendrick had managed to seal before he left, keeping her hands from what she covets. To access it, she will need the king's ring, and who better to retrieve it for her than the bearer of four powerful souls? For the king did not leave himself unprotected, the menacing looking glass knight protects the king's passage, and the bear of the curse must slay this beast before being able to follow Vendrick. The undead then enters a region called the Shrine of Armana. In this shrine area, the protagonist discovers a mixture of different cultures and remnants of religion. For example, we find there are several Milfanito here, whose purpose seems to be to sing to bring comfort to the dead and the dark. Yet further into the Shrine of Armana, is a far more sinister being, the hideous Demon of Song, whose soul description reads, When this demon developed a taste for human flesh, it was contained within the shrine of her mana, but the line of priestesses who long looked after the shrine and appeased the creature have died off. The shrine not only confines the dead, but also this hideous beast, which unfortunately forms another obstacle to the king. And so we slay the beast and make our way to the undead crypt where we finally find the king and his men. Standing between us and him, however, is the mighty Velstad, the royal Aegis, the great defender of the king and the crypt. He and Raimi were once the right and left arms of the king. But when Raimi turned traitor, Velstad was the only loyal man that the king had left. Velstad and his soul have become bathed in the dark of the crypt. And so during the undead's battle with him, he unleashes the power of the dark upon us. When Velstat finally falls, we can finally have audience with the king. However, Vendrick is no more. He is simply a hollow who has dropped his equipment and clothing as he endlessly circles the chamber with no aim in sight. However, we can rescue the king's ring, the key to the king's door that seal the throne of want and Aldia's manor. The door in the basement of the castle opens, and we can enter the chamber of the Throne of Want, but we cannot reach it. We need more understanding. So the bearer of the curse uses the King's Ring to access Aldia's manor. We had discussed Aldia and his works in the Rise of Fall of Drang Laeg, yet even what we see here firsthand is pretty shocking. The remnants of Aldia's research into breaking the cycles and dragons. Passing through the manor, we find ourselves in the Dragon Eyrie where Aldia's experiments seem to roam free, with members of the Path of Dragon even coming here to worship the dragon kin that flies around the Eyrie. 
As we make our way through this shrine to the dragons, we are once again interrupted by Aldia. This will be the third time that Aldia has interrupted us, including once in the undead crypt. Once again he poses questions to us. They all have the same question. What is the point in carrying on the cycle? Whether you choose dark or whether you choose light? This is an important question to Aldia, one which we will answer later on. At the top of the eerie, we discover the fruits of Aldia's experimentation, a fake ancient dragon. This recreated dragon is made from a giant, as per the giant soul that it drops, and the corpses that we see in Aldia's manor, and the soul of an ancient dragon description found in Brightstone Seldora. For the soul of the corpse found in Brightstone Seldora reads as follows. Soul of a great ancient dragon that stands magnificently deep within the shrine. That shrine being the dragon shrine found in Dragon's Eyrie. Despite being a human engineered dragon, it still has some power, and it gives us the Ashen Mist Heart, an ability that allows us to peer through the mists of time by travelling into the past through memories of others. With the power of this ancient dragon, we return to the forest of the fallen giant, where we peer into the memories of the giants who fell here. Through this we witness the siege of Drang Lake while it happened, and the collapse of the fort and the collapse of the kingdom. Eventually after trolling through the memories of several giants, we travel back in time to a battle where the Lord of Giants himself is waging war on the battlements. Looking at the shape and size of this giant lord, he looks to be physically the same as the last giant. Furthermore, the soul of the last giant says, The Lord of Giants who had brought rack and ruin to the entire kingdom was said to have been felled by an unknown warrior. His beaten and broken remains were then dragged beneath the stronghold, where he was sealed away. The last giant is the lord that was defeated that day, and the bearer of the curse is the unknown warrior who felled him after travelling back in time using the Ashen Mist Heart. After the defeat of the lord, we earn the giant's kinship. Without speculating, and simply put, this allows us to manipulate the golems that we found in the Throne of Wands. We proceed to the throne and face down its protectors, the Watcher and the Defender. With the throne's defences finally down, Nishandra now chooses to reveal her true self and close in on her prize. She is here for the throne herself and she has used us to clear the way. The items that we can make from Nishandra's soul tells us that she was once a shard of Manus, who was defeated in the abyss. For example, the Scythe of Want that can be created from her soul reads as follows. A scythe born from the soul of Nishandra, the old one of the abyss was reborn in death, split into minuscule fragments and spread across the land. After regaining their shapes, they crawled forth, yearning for strong souls in search of greater power. This tells us that she, like her other sisters, cuddled up to power, in this case Vendrick, and used him to get more power. She therefore encouraged him to invade and pillage the land of the giants and it is why she wants the throne, that he has denied her. However, by this point, the bearer of the curse has become too powerful, and the Chandra is no match for us, and we cast her back into the dark from when she came. At the moment of our victory, Aldia once more appears to test us. He demands an answer from us, an answer to the question as to what we will do when we seize the throne. Will we uphold the Age of Light, or will we usher in an Age of Dark? He tests us one final time, and we defeat him in battle. And so, with the throne within our reach thanks to the giant's kinship, which will command the golems to form a bridge, we have two choices. A. We become a king, and ponder whether to light the fire or not. Or B. We listen to Aldia. Aldia's life has been dedicated to find a way outside the endless cycles of light and dark, that there must be another way to escape the cycle. Is it within the dragon's immortality? Or is it in simply refusing to play along with the cycle? What do you want? Tell me. Light, dark, or something else entirely?
Yes, indeed. As the legend of the flame continues to seduce hero after stupid hero, the world is reborn countless times. But each time as the flame illuminates the world anew, more scars are revealed from the withdrawing shadows. With each new cycle, the world grows just a little more twisted and just a little more pale. Towards the end of each era, the flame draws its strength from the accursed, like a cancer sustaining itself on the humanity of those it pretends to serve. But the story is always the same. Some well-meaning dullard comes along and sacrifices themselves to relight the flame and puts the undead curse on hold. That dullard is then hailed as a Lord of Cinder, if he is strong enough to survive the process intact. <laughs> of course, I am very flexible when it comes to the term intact, as it is questionable to how much of their minds actually remain. Jumping ahead to the present, I guess, the fire begins to fade yet again, but this time a bell tolls. It's a signal for five Lords of Cinder to rise once more to give themselves to the flame. But this time, instead of heeding its call, the Lord turns their back on the fire. Apparently, self-immolation isn't something they were keen on doing twice. Except for one, Ludlith of Coraland. Diminutive in stature, perhaps, but powerful in purpose. Or just an idiot, depending on your perspective. When it's clear that the Lords of Cinder aren't coming back, the bell tolls again to awaken the unkindled ash. A person who previously tried to light the flame but were unsuccessful. The unkindled ash is tasked with the unenviable burden of bringing back the four remaining Lords of Cinder so they can once again roast in the name of the first flame. No easy task as all of the Lords are powerful beings with their own reasons as to why they turned their back on the flame. Aldrich, the Saint of the Deep, was a cleric who, for some reason, decided it was a good idea to begin eating people. He ate so many, in fact, that his body got bloated and turned into sludge. How that actually works, I have no idea, but you wouldn't be wrong to assume that currently Aldrich is just one big piece of sentient excrement. Luckily, depending on your perspective again, this also gave Aldrich a tremendous amount of strength and power. So, they threw him on the fire as a sacrifice to extend the Age of the Flame. I know, that doesn't sound very pleasant. So no wonder that Aldrich was just a tiny bit cranky as he returned to life. Rather than making his way to Filing Shrine, he instead decided to make his way to Anorlando, where he is currently sucking on the bones of gods. Then we have Yorm the Giant, known as the reclusive lord of the profane capital. A capable warrior, a giant in every sense of the word, or as I like to say, a reverse Ludlith. Yorm had the displeasure of dealing with not only one flame-related issue, but two. The linking of the first flame and the curbing of what was known as the profane flame. As Yorm blinked the fire, something went horribly, horribly wrong, and his home was engulfed by a fire, melting the flesh of the bones of the people he had once sworn to protect. This must have put a strain on his mind, but personally I think it was more of a success than a failure. Glass half full and all of that. The Abyss Watchers. A legion of warriors treading the paths of an ancient hero and his wolf companion. Bound by blood and unshakable in their purpose, this undead legion would do anything 
and I mean anything, to curb the spread of the abyss, even to go so far as to bury any kingdom at the first sign of infestation. And lastly, Prince Lothric. Now Lothric is a special case. He's technically not a Lord of Cinder, but his family had this obsession of creating a worthy heir to the flame. Even to the point where they would do any unspeakable thing to ensure that Lothric would live up to that lofty goal. Lothric, however, influenced by the first of the scholars, came to the realization that he didn't want to burn alive just because his family said so, so him and his brother Lorien retreated to the stronghold just to watch as the fire faded. Clearly, the journey of the unkindled ash would be quite arduous. After a quick stroll through the graveyard and then a battle against a warrior with a bad case of parasites, the unkindled arrives at Firelink Shrine. There, he receives a quick pep talk from the Firekeeper before he sets out to Lothric to find and then violently compel the Lords of Cinder to return to their thrones. During his sightseeing of Lothric's most compelling tourist attractions, he comes across High Priestess Emma, who informs him that the Lords of Cinder has returned to their homes. Luckily, that isn't very far, since as the fire fades, these lands converge around Lothric, and I must say, that is perhaps the most unique way to market any business. The Lothric Travel Agency! taking the travel out of traveling. In order to find the lords and return them to their thrones, the Unkindled One seeks them out at the homes they have returned to. They first go to the Cathedral of the Deep to find Aldrich, only to learn that he isn't here either. The Unkindled One does, however, meet a red-hooded man named Gale that appears to be praying to the goddess of Sin Velka within the Cathedral. Gale asks the Unkindled One if they can help him to help his lady who is inside the painted world of Ariandel, awaiting to see flame so that she may paint a new painting. When the Unkindled One agrees, they are drawn into the painted world by the remaining scrap of it Gale possesses. In this painted world of Ariandel, we can see that the world has begun to rot. This is all in part to a woman named Sister Frida, who is the eldest of three sisters that founded the Sable Church of Londor, a church dedicated to the teachings of Koth and finding the Dark Lord the Lord of Hollows, to usher in the Age of Man. Sister Frida abandoned the Sable Church and retreated to the Painted World, where she manipulated Father Arian Dell. The denizens of the Painted World state that the one thing they do right here is when the rot comes, they allow the fire to burn it and the world away to await a new one. The opposite of what they do on the outside world, constantly rekindling the first flame to preserve the Age of Fire and stave off the natural order of things. But Sister Frida had convinced Father Ariandel otherwise, and he now sits below the painting's chapel, flailing himself so that his blood may appease the flame that would otherwise burn the rot and world away. The Unkindled One finds the lady of whom Gale spoke, a young painter locked away on Frida's orders. She tells them that in order to paint a new painting that she must first see flame. The Unkindled One knows that this can't happen so long as Sister Frida and Father Ariandel have seized power and confronts them. After battling with the stubborn Frida, who quite frankly kept refusing to die, the Unkindled One finally succeeds and takes her and Father Ariandel out of the picture. The flame, no longer appeased by the Father's blood, starts to slowly consume the painting and burn the rod away. The Unkindled One returns to the painter and she thanks them. She says that now that she's seen flame, she's just waiting for her Uncle Gale to bring her the proper pigment for her painting, the Dark Soul of Man. After helping the painter in the painted world, the Unkindled One returns to their world and to their duty, only to find that Gale is missing. Either way, the Unkindled One travels to the ruins of the old city of the gods, Ain Orlando, to find that Aldrich is there in the process of devouring Gwendolyn, the god of the Dark Moon. Aldrich refuses to return for his duty, so the Unkindled One slays him and brings back his ashes instead. In the profane capital, Yorm the Giant refuses to do so, as well as the Abyss Watchers in Ferenc Keep. So the Unkindled One is left with the same choice, bring them back to do their duty, or bring back their ashes. Ashes, they will all become. Finally, 
In Lothric Castle, the young Kunal one confronts Prince Lothric about his duty, but the young prince cares not for the fire in his practices, couldn't care less if it all went away. Though he and his brother Lorien are a powerful force to be reckoned with, the unkindled one proves to be their match, and they collect Lothric's ashes. While traversing the halls of Lothric, heading back to Firelink Shrine and their duty completed, the unkindled one hears strange cries reverberating off the walls of the castle, and decides to investigate. The ash at last finds the source of the haunting cries that echoed through the former gardens. At the end of a great hall, a frail, twisted creature, vaguely resembling Seath, the pale drake of old, cradles nothing in his claws. This creature is Osiris, the king of Lothric, who in his quest to create the perfect air to kindle the flame had become obsessed with dragonkind. His body was warped by the magic of the Grand Archives' heretics, and with this new draconic form, he fathered a half-breed child with Lothric's queen and named him Ocelot. Shortly after she had given birth to this child, though, she disappeared. Now, at the end of this age of fire, Osiris is huddled in the remains of his castle. He's lost his eyesight, his human body, his queen, and by the look of his empty hands, quite possibly the air he demanded himself to create. In his delusion, he lashes out at the ash, all the while making desperate pleas to his child to come out of hiding assuring him that there is nothing to fear, for he is the child of dragons. As the fight rages on, something seems to break within him. He screams Ocelot's name, holds the hand that seemed to cradle the unseen child aloft, and slams it into the floor. It is unclear if this is the end of the half-breed heir, as the baby's cries are still heard echoing throughout the crumbling hall, until Osiris himself falls silent. The Ash succeeds where countless assassins had failed before. Osiris had lost much before their encounter, but now he had lost what remained of his unraveling mind, and ultimately his life. What lies beyond the fallen king's final resting place is, for lack of better words, confounding. A corridor of dead serpent men and a drake blood knight give way to a darkened, eerily familiar path. This is the path to the Cemetery of Ash from the beginning of the journey, but is now known as the Untended Graves. From the outset, it is unclear if this realm is a view into the past, a vision of the future, or an intersection of similar realms as time and space become progressively more convoluted in the ending days of an Age of Fire. It's a realm almost exactly like where the ash awoke some time ago, except it is shrouded in perpetual darkness. A familiar grave, not unlike the one the ash itself rose from, is surrounded by Corvians and is open and empty save for a ring, a treasure enshrined to this place by Lothric's now departed queen to serve the unkindled one who finds it well, whenever or wherever they may be. In the same place the Ash found Eudix Gundir, with a coiled sword embedded in his chest, stands Gundir. Again. This time, however, he is not laboring from being impaled by a sword, nor is he afflicted with the pus of man. He is called a champion in this realm. But all signs indicate that whatever he believes he is champion of may be beyond his reach. He stands in a dark world by a shrine without fire, a bell of awakening that does not toll, and his fate as the eternal judge of the unkindled does not yet appear to be sealed. All the same, he is but another heir of fire who has failed to perform his duty of kindling the flame for one reason or another. As with all other heirs, he meets his end at the hand of the unkindled ash. The path beyond Gundyr's arena is eerily similar to that which the Ash traversed after being judged at the start of this quest, but is now teeming with black knights that patrol its many twisting walkways instead of idle undead. Beyond them lies the final bit of this Mirror Realm similarities, a Firelink Shrine where the central flame has long since gone out and cannot be relit. In this dark and alternate version of Firelink Shrine, the Unkindled One stumbles upon a very peculiar discovery. 
the eyes of the first Firekeeper. Once collected and brought back to their own Firekeeper in their Firelink Shrine, the Firekeeper explains to the Unkindled One that it is forbidden for Firekeepers to have eyes, and that these eyes will reveal frightful images of betrayal, a world without fire. The Unkindled One, however, does wish for a world without fire, for a ceasing of the linking of the flame, perhaps learned and understood from the lessons taught in the painted world of Ariando. The Firekeeper acquiesces and agrees to help, although advises they should keep it a secret until the day of their grand betrayal. The Firekeeper also tells the Unkindled One that, should they change their mind, they need but kill her and strip the eyes from her person, so that she won't be seduced by the dark. She continues to tell them that the eyes reveal a vast stretch of darkness, a world without fire, but not the same darkness one sees when stripped of vision. In the far distance of this dark, she senses the presence of tiny flames, like embers left by lords of cinder past. The unkindled one, whatever their choice, still has a journey left to complete. So along with the firekeeper, they place the ashes of the Lords of Cinder upon their thrones, and the Firekeeper begins her ritual to open the way to the Kiln of the First Flame. The ritual complete, the growing of disparity of a final encounter looming just past the horizon. The Chosen Ash presenting himself to the end of all things, the darkened Firelink. The sudden flash fried corpses standing about, but curious is the Chosen Ash that another bonfire twinkles in his sight igniting the flame and thus he is given to an ulterior end. Something strange perches the ash's hand. Soot and heavy, the dragging and sinking feeling, sludge, not through swamp, but the ash itself. An old hag pilgrim, curious as to who and how you are here, but no matter of her, she sells just a small tool to be on their way. The dreg heap, both the space and time where everything is ending. Parts of Londor, Lordran, and Lothric seem to twist turn, combine, and feverishly mix. This is the place where we find it all, past, present, future, boiling around one another to the exact point when a version of Armageddon has reached its epitome. Let's take a quick step back from storytelling to let you know what and how the Dreg Heap is even a place we can exist. The Dreg Heap is where the sediment of souls culminate, when both a person hollows completely and loses every ounce of humanity. We also know that the creatures existing in this area are made up of these soul dregs. The things we collect as Aldrich Faithful, we also know that these creatures might have a relation to the Devourer of Gods himself, Aldrich. As an Aldrich Faithful, we collect soul dregs from trespassers for the Ark Deacon. These soul dregs are the very bottom, the thing left behind after the soul's power is gone. The Unkindled Ash pushes forward, guided by the remnants that Gale has left behind, leaving a safe spot to plunge further down. Bluey finds creatures born of the dark. These creatures, dregs in human forms, facilitate the instinctual purpose to devour those with humanity. The rest was needed. The drop long and dark. The feeling that you've done this before races past your mind and you shake it off. The Chosen plunges down into the depths of the darkness. Only to hear the piercing cries of two, twin demon brothers enraged that another human has found their kind. These demons get ready to fight once more. The strange sensation fills the Chosen Ash once again. The scream hinders the fight as you begin to take down one, then darkness. The battle fought, and the bonfire is a feeling the Chosen Ash has such a relief to be at. He knows now. The demons have taken him a turn of three now, and it's his turn. He brightens his blade and lunges forth unto death or victory. Each time the drag heat goes deeper, time seems to fluctuate. The Ashen One is unsure as the timelines of everything converging into itself seems to draw a line. The demon brothers fall and he continues through the archways, oh so resembling the lower depths of the long ago kingdom. The Unkindled One brings forth a banner to summon the Batwinged Demons to take him to a distant castle keep. A city built upon a cliff's edge, a focal of swirling sands, the Ringed City. In all of its might and construct, it would seem that this is a grand line of construction, yet that isn't its purpose. Its very nature is a prison to keep something hidden. The Unkindled One has not a thought of what that is, only that Gale is searching for something here, for he is the one that has led them to this place. The entrance to the Ringed City is only a momentary display of one's own thoughts. In the distance, the bells toll. 
The judge and executioner stands, calling upon the spirits of those who fell in its defense to rise and defend it once more. The Ringed City is a peculiar place. Here time works very cautiously. Not only is it the present, but it is also the distant future, and past, much like the Dreg Heap. The best way to put this is that this is the place where time began and will ultimately end. Each new area seems to be leaps and bounds further into time. With each passing step, the deep and the abyssal creatures seem not afraid but hungry, and the judges and ring knights act as patrol. The Ashen One would find more of the area containing sunken churches and locusts that seem to come from the sludge as if it was a home to them. Then, we hear it. The deafening cry. The wind from beating wings. The ear-shattering roar of a grand ancient dragon, Medir. Before the future fall, before the first relinking of the flame existed a war. A grand war against the ancient dragon spanned many years, till one day a traitor amongst the dragons came to become a fearful self-proclaimed god, and offered to end the war in his favor, the fall of the ancient dragons. This dragon, Seath, was granted a dukedom and was given free reign over the libraries, and thus began the experiments to give birth to another life. The first half-breed, taken, feared by the power of life hunt. The next, given shape, a failure, but useful, given to the court became a valiant warrior. Shira, the woman who became a friend of Medir, daughter of the Duke. The one who entered the dark room with a renegade pygmy impaled upon her halberd, another who reached the end. Friend of Medir, the dragon presented by the Duke to Lord Gwyn in the form of an egg. Medir, a mighty ancient dragon, one of the last, given a task to fight the abyss as the perfected guard. Medir did its job faithfully for ages on end, had a single friend who he cherished, and became corrupted even at the end of the world. His friend was known as Shira, the last line of the Spear of the Church to protect Gwyn's youngest daughter, Filianor. But here at the end of the world, not even mighty Medir could resist the dark forever, and he fell corrupted to it. Shira, the daughter of the Duke, beseeches the Unkindled One to remove the dragon from its misery, to end it. This tells the Ash everything they need to know. Nothing is there to hold it back, nothing can truly stop the Abyss, stop the dark from swallowing everything. Medir's job is done, and the Unkindled One charges forth, determined to rid the dragon of its eternal duty. What are we? Little embers clinging to life? Not because we exist to lay the foundation of an old era, but as we lead to a new dawn? A new era? That's what it feels like as the Unkindled One continues their journey. They reach for the doors of the Church of Filianor, the last bastion of the Ringed City. As they enter, they're confronted by another judge, telling them to go away, to leave this place or be damned. The Unkindled One refuses and slays him before raising upon the steps leading to the final chamber. In this chamber, the Ash looks upon a woman, looking as if she hasn't moved in millennia. Filianor, the youngest daughter of Gwyn, guardian of the end upon her throne of death. She is crying, crying tears of darkness as she doesn't wake. The Unkindled One ponders a moment and sees the egg laying, resting, broken in her arms embracing this dark, centered, rotting construct. Reaching towards her, the Unkindled One touches the egg and it breaks. Filianor shifts slightly as the illusion is broken. A white light envelops them both, blinding the Unkindled One, almost as if a rush of time overlaps everything. As the light fades away, the Ashen One stands before the broken egg and a dead Filianor. Her job and her mission succeeded and failed at the same time. The end has come. The illusion shattered and the ringed city disappeared. The barren wastes of both sand and wind are all that is left. Barely a kingdom remains to peak above the desert. Filianor is a tale of sorrow. She was given to the ringed city as its warden. She held upon an egg that locked away the pygmy lords at their thrones. She was ordered and given away to fulfill this task, daughter of Gwyn sitting upon her throne of death to damn those who Gwyn truly feared. Here. In the now-ruined tower of Filianor at the world's end, 
The unkindled one steps outside to see this vast desert of dilapidated kingdoms converged into the sand. The unkindled one sees the shrill corpse of one of the pygmy lords barely clinging to life as they drag themselves through the sand, crying out to Filianor for help in fear of the Red Hood who wants to devour their dark soul. The unkindled one presses on in the direction from which the pygmy lord was fleeing until they arrive at the ruined throne room of the pygmy lords. It's there that they see Gale, hunched over a corpse of one of the lords, devouring its dark soul. Gale has become this tainted creature, thirsting only for the dark soul, and perhaps power as well. He turns to the unkindled one and demands that they hand over their dark soul to him for his lady's painting. The unkindled one knows that Gale must be stopped and that he can go no further. So here we have the greatest and maybe the most tragic standoff at the end of the world, where two undead fight over a sliver of dark while the fate of the world hangs in the balance. The unkindled one has grown immeasurably strong by this point, and eventually you overcome Gale and destroy him, taking from him the very blood of the dark soul. Some say that Gale only lusted for power and thus stole this blood from the pygmy lords, but some believe that he knew the blood of these pygmy lords had long dried up and that he devoured them in order to sort of digest the blood into a pigment, knowing that only the unkindled one would be powerful enough to defeat him and eventually bring that blood back to the painter. Though, you can't really say for sure. I'd say most people prefer to believe the latter as it paints the tale of a hero in this bleak world. The Unkindled One returns to the painted world to find it almost fully consumed by the flame. We give the painter the pigment of the dark soul, and she begins to paint a new world, a cold, dark, and very gentle place. A world painted from the very soul of humanity itself, a bright beacon of light in an otherwise hopeless world. At the kiln of the first flame, the Unkindled One defeats the soul of Cinder, an amalgamation and guardian of the first flame, made up of those who had once linked the fire. They then summon the Firekeeper, and she takes the first flame from its mantle, and together they watch as darkness, a true darkness, descends upon the world. Yet, just as she mentioned earlier, she could see tiny flames dancing in the distance, embers of Lords of Cinder past not unlike the manner in which the tiny embers sparked into the first flame, not unlike the very fire that Lord Gwyn and the others found their strength within, perhaps left to them in the same manner, by Lords of Cinder Past. The first flame quickly fades. Darkness will shortly settle. But one day, tiny flames will dance across the darkness. like embers linked by Lord's Pass. Ashen One. Hearest thou my voice still?
to me.